The soul has a very close relationship to desire. Very, very close relationship to desire. To, I thought that was still up here. Sex, pleasure, uh, intimacy, beauty. The soul has a very close relationship to that. Now I'm going to tell you just a little story about that. A number of years ago I was in Rome and I, I, I made my own little pilgrimage, a small one, to the Museo Capitolino. I wanted to go there to pay homage at the sculpture of Venus that is at that, at that place because that is one of the most important, one of the most uh, influential, powerful Venuses that was ever made and it's there in Rome the Capitolino, Venus. So I went up there, but as I was heading, I finally got to her, but as I was going to, to, uh, to the third floor of that place to see her, on the second floor, I was walking down this very wide marble corridor, and at the end of the corridor, I couldn't believe my eyes what was there. I knew it because I had seen pictures of it. There was a sculpture there of two young people. The sculpture was about maybe four or five feet tall. And there were two young people caressing each other, just about to kiss, with one, you know, with each having their arm around the other, very delicate, these curls in their hair, and all in stone, and, and just very delicately holding each other. And you know who those two were? Psyche and Eros. Do you know who Psyche and Eros are? Psyche is the soul, Eros is pleasure, sensuality, lust, desire, pleasure, what did I say, I keep saying pleasure. Um, <laughs> uh, this, this is who we have there in that sculpture. We have the soul yearning for, love, for desire and lust and sensuality, and we have the uh, desire and pleasure and sexuality yearning for soul in that sculpture. It's a magnificent sculpture. I don't know, I don't know what, what you could have that more precious than that image of, of what is going on within us in our society and in ourselves. Our soul longs for pleasure. Our soul longs for uh, a, a sexual fulfillment. And I want to say what I mean by that later. Our soul longs for uh, the ability to feel desire and to feel our lusts and to feel our, our um, attractions without feeling bad about them. I think, it, I think our soul longs for these things. Now, I'm not suggesting at all any kind of immorality in this. In fact, just the opposite. There's a kind of morality that comes out of that acceptance of desire that is much stronger, much more, in fact, somewhere more limiting in many ways than that other kind that is sheer repression. There's a huge difference between repressing these desires and uh, allowing them their place and then finding that they have their limits. And they're okay. It's all right to love, to have your soul love all of those feelings and those desires. And it's all right to have those desires as long as they have a soul because they need the soul for completion. We should all go now, shouldn't we, to Rome and bow down before that, that sculpture of uh, Psyche and Eros. Now, I'd like to go back to one of my other dead friends for a minute. Epicurus. Epicurus was a philosopher uh, born in the year 341 BC, a long time ago. And he, he became a philosopher, he traveled a little bit, then he settled in, in Athens. And he created a school of philosophy called, it's usually called the Garden School, um, because he, he met, his friends would meet in this garden of his house. I've often imagined it, you know, with maybe with lettuce and cucumbers around, like a Greek salad, you know. They're sitting there in this Greek salad discussing desire and pleasure. And interestingly, Epicurus, his group included men and women, free people and slaves. It was, it was an all-inclusive group and equals of equals. Epicurus himself was, a, was known as a very kind, gentle, moderate, very, very moderate person. We have one statement about him. He asked a friend, he said, just bring me a half a pound of cheese and I'll be feasting for the next month. And he was not, you know, we think of Epicureanism as overeating and indulgence. It has nothing to do with Epicurus whatsoever. 
Epicurus' philosophy and his way of life was extremely moderate. He said you can't have pleasure unless the people around you also have pleasure. We have to have a community. We have to be responsible to the people with us before we can have pleasure. He said that there are pleasures that are very natural. There are pleasures that, that are necessary, like food and sleep and other things, sex. And there are pleasures that aren't necessary, you know, like... Uh, what's it called, a Lamborghini or something, you know, you don't need a really fancy car, you don't need, there are things we don't need we might like and they, they please us, but th those are not necessary pleasures. He said there are kinetic pleasures and there are static pleasures. He, that means, he says, there are, some pleasure, there are some pleasures that you enjoy as you're doing them and then they're kind of over, and there are other pleasures you have that just stay with you forever or for a long time. Those are static or stable pleasures. And he mentioned, and he said, and everyone down in history who followed him said that the number one pleasure in life is friendship. And all the Epicureans, when you look in the history of Epicurean writing, they all talk about friendship. Ficino, who was an Epicurean, um, uh, wrote letter after letter about the qualities of friendship and how to cultivate friendships and how important it was to cultivate friendship. He even wrote a letter, one letter called the Convivium, Convivium which means to live together, convivial. He wrote a, a one letter on how to gather together convivially and how to get your friends together. He wrote a letter and even tells you what kind of food to get and, and how to plan your party and all of this. Because friendship is the number one thing. Just think of it. When you have a friend, this is a, this is a stable pleasure. This is not something you just have and you have for a moment, but it's a stable pleasure. That's how he looked at it. Now, it's my view, it's my sense that when we don't allow ourselves for one reason or another, the, the, the stable, the stable, necessary, uh, ordinary pleasures of life, bad things happen. I think it breeds violence. I think that breeds violence. It's, you can't get away with just not having those pleasures. It's not like saying, well, I just don't have those in my life. What happens, you don't have them, there are results. There's a, there's a response, something, there's, a, there's a consequence to not having those pleasures. And what are those consequences? One might be depression. Remember, it's the soul that gives a sense of vitality. And the soul loves desire and pleasure. Remember the statue of uh, Eros and Psyche. You don't give the soul its pleasure, I think that's a cause of depression. A major cause of depression. And we have a lot of depressed people in this world. We have a lot of depressed, wealthy people with good jobs, going to work every day with, with families, all of those things, but depressed. What's that depression? Because, not because of it for any external reason, because they've got everything they need, it seems. I think they don't have the deep pleasure that Epicurus was talking about. 